So good afternoon, everybody. Actually, welcome back after the first session. And uh, it's always extremely difficult to start uh, afternoon sessions be because they are after lunch. So welcome here at our university. And we will start uh, our plenary session that has a very interesting title. We will talk, we will discuss processes and narratives to create civic maps around the world. And uh, this intriguing uh, topic will be presented by our colleague, by our very good friend, Thomas Breyer. Thomas Breyer is uh, associate professor and director of Center for Public and Nonprofit Management. He is a coordinator of public administration track, public affairs PhD program, School of Public Administration in the College of Health and Public Affairs at the University of Central Florida. Uh, Thomas is also a Fulbright Scholar uh, of our university at the Institute of Public Policy and Administration at our faculty. And also, Thomas Breyer is a visiting professor at uh, Edge Hill University, uh, Institute for Public Policy and Professional Practice. His research and teaching focuses on citizen participation with government and collaborative relations across different sec uh, sectors of our contemporary society. He has won multiple awards um, for his research, for his teaching and service, including the most recently got one, uh, the award, uh, the scholarship of 2015 Florida State University System Award for Community Engagement Scholarship. He has published three books, namely Higher Education Beyond Job Creation, universities, citizenship, and community, national service and volunteerism, achieving impact on our communities, and uh, recently I also have this book in hands. It is a present for us uh, from Thomas, his recent book, Social Media for Government, Theory and Practice. So I can talk an hour about Thomas' achievements. But I think uh, we should give the floor to Thomas and we will start uh, your plenary lecture. lecture. So please. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, and uh, I, I join uh, the Dean in welcoming everybody to, uh, to CONUS University of Technology and, and the great city of CONUS. It is uh, like a second home for me. And, uh, uh, and I hope everyone here enjoys it uh, just as much as I do. Uh, and we'll return, maybe not quite as often as I do, but, uh, but often enough, because it is a beautiful city with much to do and uh, the program for this conference includes, I know, many activities, including a tour of the Old Town on Wednesday, which is going to be phenomenal. Uh, so I hope you look forward to that. Uh, my topic today is uh, processes and narratives to create civic maps around the world. And uh, as was introduced uh, about my work, my, my focus in my research and my teaching is citizen participation. I have a, a deep interest in how we structure our government institutions, how our nonprofit and non-government organizations work independently and in collaboration with government and with other sectors of society in order to give citizens in all of our different countries the opportunity to contribute meaningfully to political life, to contribute meaningfully to uh, increasing the quality of life in all of our uh, different neighborhoods, in all of our different cities, in all of our communities. And 
what I would like to focus on today is this question fundamentally of how do we recognize active, meaningful citizenship around the world when it happens? Where is it? How do we find it? How do we measure it? And to begin, I'll say first that my presentation is broken into, I think, eight different parts. Not all in equal length, of course, but the first part of my presentation, I'd like to speak a little bit about black holes. In September of 2015, uh, scientists made a compelling discovery, a discovery that proved Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. What does this have to do with civics? You can read the brief description on the screen about colliding black holes. When a pair of black holes, each about 30 times our sun's mass, collided 1.3 billion years ago, the event sent gravitational waves rippling across the universe. They were heard by a pair of laser interferometers on the 14th of September 2015. In this waveform animation that I'll show you in just a moment, the first two passes are played at the actual frequencies of the event. It's an incredible scientific discovery. This is the sound of two black holes merging in the universe. If you look at a rendering of what these black holes are doing when they are about to merge, they are spinning around each other, spinning around each other in the universe, ultimately one basically sucking the other up. And this is the sound of that suck, basically. Now what's interesting about this, it's a really small amount of time that is measured by very precise scientific instruments. There was a scientist, one of the scientists involved in the project, uh, from the University of Florida, not my university, but another one of our universities in the state of Florida, who described the magnitude of the measurements in this way. If you take your thumbs, why don't you all do this with me? Take your thumbs, <laughs> put them as close together as you can, without touching. Now hold them up to your eye, and what do you see? Not very much, right? This is the kind of measurement that was taken of this merger of these two black holes. Not very much. Not much can be seen. That's the scale of the measurement. A very small event with a huge impact, right? Small event with a huge impact. And I'm going to use this as a metaphor for civics for citizen participation, because when we think about citizen participation and we look to, for examples of how citizens are engaged with each other, how they are involved in our society, trying to make a difference in society, we tend not to look at civics like this, looking for the very small events, the small examples. We tend to look for big events, big protests, big movements, big voter turnouts, the standard ways for citizens to participate but my argument is we really ought to be looking right there at the small scale, the small event. So how do we recognize it? I have a map here of the world population. You can see some more statistics on population estimates over the next couple of decades. See Asia is set to continue to grow, Africa grow quite a bit, Sub-Saharan Africa grow quite a bit. Here in Europe, we don't have much growth that will be experienced, nor in North America. But the world population overall is going to increase and increase and increase. Now, as a scholar of citizen participation and someone who thinks philosophically about these issues, I look at these numbers of citizen, of, of the world population, I look at the people on the street walking around, and I ask myself, who are they and how are they involved civically? And I know the answer is, at least when we measure like this, they're not really involved. 
We have masses of people who are not involved, and this troubles me. This actually makes me quite depressed as a philosopher of <laughs> civics, yeah? Where are they involved? Who are these people? Where is the civic action? Where is the civic identity? Overpopulation, we have masses of people. Where are they involved civically? We have masses of people that go into public transportation. Are they involved civically as they cram into the train? I love this picture, don't you? The two train conductors pushing the passengers onto the train. Where is the civics? Where is the community? Where is the community identity? I'm sure we have all experienced traffic jams a little bit. Oh, speaking from Florida, we have them all the time, mostly around Disney World, which I have to drive past every single day. <laughs> Where is the civic action? Robert Putnam quite famously wrote in the, his book, Bowling Alone, and describing social capital, that one reason that we see a decline in civics is because people are driving one person in one car for miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers without stop, and so they don't talk to each other. You drive to work, it takes you a very long time. You drive home, you pull into your garage, you go up to your home, your, your home and you never talk to anybody. We have an isolation because everyone is driving in their car. Where is the civic action? Well, it's right there. <laughs> I look something like this almost every day I drive to and from my home to my university. <clears throat> There's Disney World. Where is the civic action? Look at the masses of people. This is what I think about. This is what actually keeps me awake at night. I look at masses of people like this, and I say, what would happen if all of these people were engaged civically somehow? What could we do in our communities if they were civically engaged somehow? Knowing that when we measure civic engagement like this, with a big lens, we're not seeing it. Where is that civic activity? All right, part two. Okay, I made it about a minute and 20 seconds. <laughs> what did you hear? I heard some whispering. <laughs> People laughing a little nervously, like I've lost my mind. <laughs> There's an American composer named John Cage <laughs> who wrote a composition called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. I find it quite courageous that he could go out onto a stage and sit quietly for four minutes and 33 seconds. It was a challenge to get to one minute right now. <laughs> John Cage is a, a, a composer, a musician, who uh, wrote this composition, four minutes, 33 seconds. He walks out on stage, sits at the piano, and sits for four minutes and 33 seconds. And the idea was that the sounds that came from the audience, the whispers, the small giggles, crinkling of candy wrappers, coughs, sneezes, that was the real music. Yeah? Not the whatever he would play on the piano, but the music are the diverse sounds that come from the audience, right? They don't really blend together very well. They don't really make sense. Maybe they are a little bit um, uh, 
um, out of sync, out of rhythm, not in harmony, a lot of discord, but that's where the music is. And I love this as a civics metaphor as well. The music are the people. The music is us, are the citizens, not the classical musician. The music are the people. So white, a blank page or a canvas. When we see a blank white sheet like this, what do we think? When you look at this, do you say, there's nothing there? Or do you look at this and say, there's so much potential in that space? If you know the musical theater production, Sunday in the Park with George by Stephen Sondheim, there's a wonderful song about, uh, about this basic idea. Uh, it's a musical about uh, a George Seurat a painter who uh, asks this question. White, a blank page or canvas? What is it? He sees a canvas, an opportunity to draw, an opportunity to create. And this is what citizen participation is. The music is us. So I want to walk through a few examples of where this music can be found. Again, we're going to start to look at this level of analysis. Thumbs together. So we're calling this citizen noise, those random sounds that come from the audience. Volunteerism, citizens coming together to paint a house. Volunteerism around the world is not particularly high when we measure it using standard measures. Right? 25% of American citizens report that they volunteer at least once a year. Here in Lithuania, it's about 13% say they volunteer or report volunteering at least once a year. It's about the same in Latvia. We can look across Europe and other parts of the world to look at volunteer rates. But what we know is that those official volunteer rates, those official volunteer measures are grossly underreporting what is actually happening. We are looking in the absolute wrong places for where citizens are active. I would bet these people pictured in, in this photograph, if asked, are you volunteering? They would probably say no. Maybe they're helping a friend, maybe they're helping a neighbor, maybe they're working through their church organization and they don't feel that this activity is a sacrifice as we would think of volunteering to be, we would think of this as an obligation to help a neighbor, an obligation to work within our church, to pursue our ministries in church. We have a very bad way of measuring where volunteer action is actually occurring. This is a picture from Gwangju, South Korea. 1989, the Gwangju uprising. Thousands of people were hurt severely or killed by South Korean military as they were, the citizens came together to protest the anti-democratic tendencies of the regime. It's a bad day in Gwangju, obviously. But we see something like this throughout history, of course. We see it here in the Baltic states. We see it now in Egypt. Syria, all over the world we see and have seen examples of citizens who quite anonymously go out into the world, go out, put themselves at risk, their names never known, their civic activity never officially recorded. This is such a powerful image, not only because of the violence depicted, but the person who is about to be beaten has his head down. We don't know who it is. He is completely anonymous, which is the way we typically measure these kinds of mass protests. The individual is not recognized. Here's a young woman 
walking through a crowded city street, not paying attention to the world around her, her, her eyes on the phone. How many of us walk around? I almost got cr crushed by a skateboarder at my university campus. Not because I was doing that, but he was skateboarding and on his phone at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> these are citizens who are active in their own way maybe they are not in touch with the identity of the place maybe they are not communicating with people in the real world as we would think about it but in the digital space who is she what is she thinking who is she communicating with how do we track her behavior we don't know again she's someone who is quite anonymous who blends into the city fabric, part of the crowd, and we just don't know who she is. There's an organization called Femin. Feminist organization, sex extremism is what they talk about. They have chapters around the world. These are women who protest by uh, going half naked to public events, public spaces, to protest what they consider to be hostility towards women, what they consider to be uh, oppressive regimes that not only hurt women, but other elements of society. And this is their form of protest. Of course, it creates quite a stir. But they're not officially recognized as legitimate protesters, certainly by government. It's quite interesting to see some of the videos that they post on their website of these half-naked women being hauled off by big men in uniform. It's, it's, you can, it, it, it proves their points, basically. The, those are the images they want to display. But who are they? What is their identity? What are they thinking about? Where do they go next? We don't capture this sort of thing in our statistics. There's a pantomime, a mime. This mime has had some interesting experiences, but he wasn't willing to talk about them. That's a joke about mimes. No, really? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> but why not? This is uh, somebody, uh, two people, who went to Venice Beach, California, to register citizens to vote in the United States. The mime was appropriately representing the silent majority of the country who don't vote. But we don't capture that in our civics data. Recently at the University of Central Florida, we had citizens protest one of our presidential candidates. And I'll let you guess who it was. Now these citizens came together in one group, so they're a bit more measurable. But one by one, they just are in the background. They are not recognized. They are part of that mass crowd, not participating. Then we have online citizens. On Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Instagram. And this is from Second Life, a virtual world space where we can recreate this very space in the virtual setting. So for future conferences, we can create this entire room. You all can be sitting there, just as you are. The chairs, the camera recording it. I could be here standing with this presentation. We can recreate it precisely. Except here's a cool thing about it. We could all be anywhere in the world. You could be physically doing anything while watching. And in the virtual world, you could be anybody you want to be. <laughs> you can create an alternative person. And this is the funny thing about civics online as we have to begin to look at more intensively today. How do we recreate our identities and ourselves in the online environment when we can be anonymous? How many identities do we have online? What information do we share? Facebook is interesting, right? Because you can choose to selectively share parts of your life with select individuals and not with others. You are creating an identity for some that is not your identity for others. 
right? What are the implications for civics? We have these split identities. So when we measure civic engagement, who are we, who are we measuring? The person standing here, the person sitting at the Facebook, the person in the virtual world? We haven't quite figured that out. How do we measure that? And the problem with this, as we move to part four, is government doesn't know how to measure this. Government does civics, or governments tend to organize citizen participation in very scripted ways. We heard a presentation this morning in one of the sessions talking about habits that form. It's the same idea. Habits form scripts that are written, and we all have to follow the scripts. You know when you came into this room for the plenary session that your job was to sit in one of those chairs. If you chose to stand in the back of the room, all of you, I would be very uncomfortable <laughs> because we're off script, right? Government follows scripts with our citizen participation, just as the classical musician follows scripts in the musical performance. It's not appropriate to crinkle candy wrappers or start talking or whispering when we have a traditional musical performance happening, right? You'll be kicked out of the theater. Same thing in the public space. Scripted participation that does not recognize forms of engagement where the people are exercising their own identities, where they are uh, in that very small way contributing to the betterment of society when it's not measured. We count heads at meetings, we count the number of people who give testimony or write letters to the editor. We are not capturing the small civic events. And so it's almost like citizens are invisible in the eyes of government when they organize their civics. And I'll play just quickly this short clip from the movie Chicago that makes this kind of point. A human being's made of more than air With all that bulk you're bound to see him there Unless that human being next to you Is unimpressive, undistinguished, you no. Who? You still here, Andy? Yeah, I'm still here. I think. Should I bend my name, Mr. Cellophane? Cause you can look right through me, walk right by me, and never know. didn't take up too much of your time. And that's how I think we look at citizens. When we, the official scripted citizen participation processes, the civic narratives and stories we like to tell exclude so much of what is actually happening in the streets around us. And this is a significant challenge. It is a, mis it's a citizen cellophane, right? We walk past the masses of people. When you go out into Conus city streets later and you go out for an evening or whatever, pay attention to the people around you, right? Most of them are not going to be paying attention to you. And that's not unique to Conus. That's anywhere in the world. 
because we look past each other. We don't exist as unique individuals who are contributing in some way to the life that we know or the life that we would like to know or the quality of the community we would like to have. You can look right through me, walk right by me, but never know I'm there. How can we do a better job recognizing the signs, the symbols, the actions, the ideas, the values, the activities, such as those pictured here that are contributing to civic life, but yet governments and each other are not recognizing. And so my answer, partially, is to democratize the expert and expertize the demos. I'm actually not sure if expertise is a word, but we're going to use it. Democratize the expert and expertize the demos. What does it mean to democratize the expert? That means our government leaders, our government officials, need to develop a better sense of understanding who the people are, how they are active, what they do. As each of you go back to your homes, you're probably not one of Bob Putnam's individuals who drives into your garage, goes into the house, and never talks to another person until the next morning. You'll talk to somebody. You'll do something. Even helping a neighbor with something small. Saying hello to somebody. Something small. Maybe sending an email, expressing an opinion about something. It is small, but we're not capturing it. We have to help government become more familiar with and more understanding of the unique experiences of the citizens. But at the same time, we don't want to go so far to the extreme that the expertise of the government officials, just like the expertise of the opera singer or the pianist, are neglected. Expertise is important. We need experts. We need classical musicians to teach us the appreciation of fine art. We need government experts to teach us the technical requirements necessary to run a city. We can't ignore that. But that means we have to do a better job teaching and informing the people. Teaching and preparing the people for participation, not only in their informal ways, but also through formal structures. It is the difference between the music is us and the music is the artist. The government is, is us and the government is the expert. On one side, on the right side of, of the screen, the government is expert, the government is driven by results, the government is driven by a desire for efficiency, to find solutions in the most efficient, cost-effective manner where citizen participation is to quote Woodrow Wilson, one of a former U.S. president, former president of Princeton University, where he said, we have to suffer the meddlesomeness of the citizens because we are democracies. We have to suffer the meddlesomeness of the citizens because we are democracies, but they are hugely inefficient. We can't let them come in too much because it will destroy the efficiency of public administration, of government. On the other side, Government is us, driven not by results, but by processes, not by solutions, but by salutations, of courtesies, of understanding relationships. Somewhere between these two sides is where we need to be from a citizen participation perspective. We have to democratize the expert and expertize the demos. And one possible way to do that, as we think about civics, I'm a big fan of large institutions that have credibility with governments and credibility with the grassroots, with the people. The World Economic Forum is one of those institutions. They are the hosts of an initiative called Global Shapers, for anybody who is under the age of 25, just beginning in their career, young business leaders, young entrepreneurs, young civic leaders, nonprofit leaders, who have a desire to start giving back and collaborating with each other to solve tough problems. You can see on the map on the right, 
all of the locations where there are hubs or chapters of the global shapers. You can see them around the world, including here in Lithuania. These are young people that are linked together in their communities and then through the World Economic Forum linked together across the globe where they can share best practices, share ideas, find common cause, common identity, common purpose, where they cannot be anonymous. This is critical. They're building affinity groups so that they are not anonymous. They begin to recognize each other, identify each other, identify others who are like them, who are potential members, identify the next generation of members, and they get the attention of government. They regularly participate in government, national and supranational government activities to try to influence the agenda. This is a mapping of otherwise anonymous, passionate people where they can now have an impact. And so I'll close and then we'll open for questions with a revisit to this idea of finding the civics where it is happening. Just this past week I was in Zagreb, Croatia at a conference and there was a fantastic contrast right in the square outside the hotel where I was staying. I took a video, the, it doesn't seem to work on this computer, but uh, I'll describe this, the scene. It was much like the beginning of the presentation. Masses of people walking around, not paying attention to each other. Walking right by each other, not seeing each other, not knowing anybody else is there, right? This is a scene from my window. I'm actually hanging outside my window with my phone, <laughs> taking this video. You have some Hare Krishnas down here, outside my window, right? A very peaceful group. You see them in cities uh, in many, many places. Uh, walking around the city with uh, very calming music, very calming dance and graceful movement and, and so on. It's a very peaceful idea. So I, I, this struck me. You have these masses of people and then you have these Hare Krishnas who are there. Nobody's really paying attention to them except me hanging out the window with my phone. Nobody is paying attention to them, but they're trying to influence the environment. I walk downstairs, and you can't really see it in this picture, uh, and again, the video is not working, but uh, you can see here this group of people carrying the, some flags and uh, some signs and so on. A big protest action was moving right past the Hare Krishnas. So you have this contrast, the peaceful, graceful, calming influence, and these mass protesters, uh, anti-GMO was their cause. But uh, I, I don't know, there were maybe, there were more than uh, probably, uh, about 200 people at least, I would guess, in this protest line, with their rallies, their cries, their cheers. And so this sort of, I was at first disappointed because, again, I saw the masses of people. I was thinking about this presentation, and I was asking, where is the civics? Then I saw the Hare Krishnas. Then I saw this mass protest. Wow. <laughs> but how are we measuring this? How are we capturing it? How are we seeing it? And then I'll close with uh, just a short piece about one thing in the United States. AmeriCorps VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, is a program a little more than 50 years old that recruits citizens to volunteer full-time for one year. They are given a small stipend for their volunteer service. This is a symbol that is widely recognized in most of the country for the AmeriCorps VISTA program. It's a wonderful thing. About three weeks ago, this person pictured here, Gino uh, Nicholas was Amer an AmeriCorps VISTA member in a poor community in Orlando, Florida, where I live. Uh, he was in the neighborhood that he was trying to help as a, an AmeriCorps VISTA member, as a volunteer. And he was out with some kids, some young people, helping them set up a basketball game or something like that. He was in the community doing what he was supposed to do. Car came by drive-by shooting, he was killed, 22 years old. Just graduated university last year, or this past year. 
I don't show his picture in a big way for on purpose. You can Google, Google his name, Gino Nicholas. G-I-N-O-N-I-C-O-L-A-S, Gino Nicholas, if you want to see what he looks like. Full up. But it's a small picture because the work he was doing was like the work of so many other citizens that we are not recognizing. His work, you have to squint and get up real close to see what he's really doing, right? Two thumbs. This is how we need to see our civics. We need to develop better ways of seeing. We need to develop better ways of, me ways of measuring. Because we're not doing it. I've spent many years somewhat depressed about the state of our civics around the world. But as I reflect more and more, I think, you know, I think our communities are civic, more civically healthy than we think they are. But we need to do a better job seeing, we need to do a better job measuring and recognizing and creating these civic maps, these interconnected communities uh, in each of our individual neighborhoods and across our national boundaries. So with that, uh, I'll, you know, I think we have time for some questions and we can uh, take that time. Thank you. bring to the forest civil society. I'm a working like researcher and I research work that is done between employment and business, which is a focus on artists, but civil society is also a very important <coughs> topic for me. And um, the big problem is, one big problem is that um, this is such an under-researched area. So I would like to, to cite Aristotle one of my favorite um, citations. He says, investigation of reality is in a way difficult, in a way easy. An indication of this is that no one can attain it in a wholly satisfactory way, and no one, no one misses it completely. Um, um, each of us says something about nature, and although as uh, individuals we advance the subject little, if at all. From all of us taken together, something sizable results. And as the proverb has it, who can miss a barn door? So I think that it's very important that we keep raising these issues and try to make it the invisible visible. Yes, thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you. More questions? Comments? Okay, hold on. Thank you, Thomas, for a very, very interesting presentation that really is important in all communities, all societies. And this is just a remark or maybe just a joke, but a very serious one. When you ask how to measure civic participation, I think I have the answer for that. You just have to ask people one simple question. Are they happy? And if the answer is yes, it means they are participating, they are involved, they are creating their uh, communities. If they are not happy, they feel they are not happy, you have the answer behind that, that they are not participating in their community. Why I'm telling this is because I come from a very small community in Lithuania, and I noticed this. Uh, when there is no institution, when there are no boards indicating, well, some buildings or some things were done by the European Union funding, 
there are people working there. There are people contributing to each other. There are people going to the neighbors asking how they are doing. Uh, if they need help, they don't even ask. Oh, they see the, their neighbor is working. They just pick up their things and they go there. But we do not have these things whenever we have institutions. Mm -hmm. And so this is basically what you are talking about that. And the question then, besides this remark about being happy, is then um, a very forward one. How should we change the study programs for public administration so that government is no longer afraid of meaningfully participating, well, members of society. Yeah. What should we do then? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we have Very good question. We have another hour, yes? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, happiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's an interesting idea, right? Uh, mm, is it possible to be happy without being part of something greater than the self? Right? Is it possibly to is it possible to be happy when you are only uh, when you are wholly self-interested? Yeah. As so I think your suggestion is, it's not. Maybe right. If you have some sense of um, obligation to someone else, then then maybe you are more more happy. Um, <clears throat> Maybe. Uh, 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 maybe happiness. I, I think um, hmm, self-determination, efficacy. Uh, these are words that I might use instead of happiness. I think happiness can be quite complex <laughs> uh, to, to, to be a proxy measure for, for something like this. But, uh, but I think it is, um, it is something that's uh, certainly a, a a happy, happy individuals satisfy. Mm, difference between satisfaction and happiness. Happy individuals uh, who participate in community mm, will tend to have closer relations with each other. Uh, they, there will be more vibrancy in the community. We know this. From, a lot of it is from Bob Putnam's work as well, uh, from this early social capital research, actually. Um, but. Uh, that's an interesting. You know, we can talk more later about it, but it, it's uh, it's a, it's an intriguing idea as to changing our study programs to help government officials to democratize the expert. Yeah, well, both of them actually. We have to democratize the expert and expertize the demos. I think both are possible through our public administration study programs. Right. Um, I, I think public administration programs can can solve all of the world's problems <laughs> if, give, if given the chance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but here's what we do, I think. One, uh, we have to create opportunities uh, for government officials to go through training programs like, like those offered through the, uh, the Municipal Training Center here at Conus University of Technology or my Center for Public and Nonprofit Management at Central Florida. Um, uh, we have to give the opportunity for trainings that uh, put public leaders into direct contact with citizens uh, where they would typically not go. Uh, there was a, a, a public administrator I wrote an article about a number of years ago, Bill Robertson. Uh, he's, he's since passed on, but um, uh, he uh, was the head of the Bureau of Street Services for the city of Los Angeles. And his, he talked much about how he brought his employees to public meetings where the citizens in a room like this, except with a uh, completely full house, standing room only, uh, were screaming and yelling and crying and complaining about the bad services they're getting from the city government, right? And uh, he did it not to scare his, uh, his employees, his subordinates, and, and make them think, why am I in this line of work? Uh, he did it, in his words, to rid them of the fear of working with the public, right? I think this is the only way to achieve a level of comfort working with citizens who are either distrustful or ignorant of what government does. Ignorance is not bad, it is just an unknowing. Yeah? Um, so if we can, through our programs, create these opportunities, and we can do that partially by putting our students into the communities in innovative, creative ways in partnership with municipalities through service learning and other pedagogies. Um, 
So there are, there are ways through collaboration, partnership, uh, I think that we can democratize the expert and expertize uh, the demos. Okay, more questions? Okay. You and after, I'd like, yes, you and you. You raised up your hand first and uh, after that. Thank you, very Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Quite a motivational talk as well. Uh, it almost challenges me in uh, regard, because for a long time, I'm aware, I could not care less about citizens, and I'm perfectly at peace with that. <laughs> Uh, in all honesty, uh, what I care or what I like to think that I care about, that to which I pay attention, is the person or the persons and their personality and personalities. I think often citizenship, the citizen, can be an obstruction towards the person. What is a citizen after all? I, 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 I live in Britain and I witness how just a few years ago, just a couple of years ago, um, Margaret Thatcher died. And I, I was there in Britain to notice what that uh, triggered. It triggered a lot of vulgarity and a, a lot of uh, publicly expressed disgust in very, in very vulgar ways. And now I believe, it is my opinion, that Margaret Thatcher caused a lot of harm as a politician. But uh, I felt really bad to see all this really vulgar uh, reactions on the one side and I was also quite disgusted to see all the solemn uh, publicity all the publicity that some politicians would get out of all the solemnity around that event as well in contrast to all the vulgarity otherwise and, and I, in that moment I had to ask myself these questions and realize well the problem is there because they, they're all celebrating the death of a citizen now there where they're wrong is that the citizen cannot die because the citizen was never born. What died over there is a human being with everything that this involves. What stopped there, in my opinion, that really disturbs us is a self-aware person. And as, as, as much as I dislike Margaret Thatcher, the politician, I, I feel like being rather silent about uh, all that event, you know, I will die as well. I have a little, uh, some, a little bit of respect towards this human being, who per, uh, this person who lived and died, who uh, I'm sure she had someone in her, in her life who loved her, uh, despite of her political and civic uh, life. Uh, I'm sorry now for talking too much, uh, but, but just, just my point, would you agree to some extent with me that citizenship can be an, obst an obstruction towards personality? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say an ethic of citizenship can be a fundamental and grounding part of a person's personality. Uh, uh, yeah, so, it, and that, I think that's the critical part. I think if we think about citizenship and active ethical citizenship as a way of being, as a way of living, citizenship and being an active part of community becomes part of who we are, right? Whether, regardless of the kinds of decisions we make as citizens, conservative or liberal or what have you, uh, being an active citizen and promoting our passions and our causes and our interests and the interests of others becomes part of our identity, becomes part of our personality. Uh, there was a, there's a consumer advocate in the United States named Ralph Nader. He, he, used, he was uh, very popular um, in the past few decades, less so now. He's getting older, less active. And uh, he came to the University of Central Florida about 10 years ago. And uh, he had a little game that he played with an audience uh, about this size. And he said, uh, he had a volunteer stand up and say, who are you? All right, and the first uh, time someone said, their name. Who else are you? Oh, I'm a student. 
Who else are you? Well, I'm a brother, a husband, a wife, a mother, a sister. Who else are you? Oh, I work for this organization. Who else are you? Um, I like ice skating. I like to go for long walks on the beach. I like dinners by candlelight. I don't know, right? On and on until finally, maybe they get to the answer that he wanted them to have. I am a citizen, right? Uh, that citizen, being an active citizen, can be a primary part of our personality if we structure our institutions in a way to truly uh, empower. And that means through our education system, our schools, um, how our governments structure meetings and opportunities for discourse, right? Um, so I think I would disagree with you, but I'm happy to uh, go back and forth uh, later if you want. <laughs> I will detail de development of uh, the previous question. For example, let us say you remember the history of uh, Indian independence. Uh, independence. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi organized such sort of activity. But as a result, we have uh, English troops uh, went, uh, go away, but on the next stage, uh, Gandhi was killed. Uh, in this uh, situation, we see it is not possibility to fix results, to stabilize the situation. What do you think about this question? Sorry, can you re repeat How the question? How uh, 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 create fixation of results of such activity? We uh, have possibility to achieve results, but how we uh, have possibility to uh, stabilize the results, to fix results. So, I'm um, sorry, Agla, can I ask, can you re repeat, maybe you heard closer, I think the question was about uh, the measurement of citizenship, yes, and uh, how can we like uh, um, understand uh, what is the main uh, or the best ways uh, how to measure, right? Uh, or fix? Like increase citizenship participation, like fix, uh, repair, yes, increase, right? Yes. yes, so what can be done to increase uh, citizens' participation? Like how to fix these uh, results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> mm, well, I think we can all begin by going out into the streets and paying more attention to what is happening around us, uh, and getting rid of the citizen cellophane idea uh, where we are invisible to each other and invisible to our government. Um, I think that is, um, that is probably the best thing to do. And that begins with our universities, I think, of course, and how we prepare our future leaders and how we prepare uh, our students for a life of, of active citizenship. Yeah, thank you. And uh, unfortunately, our session is uh, going to end. Uh, maybe just a last question if someone wants to ask. If questions are finished, as I see. Oh, OK, so the last one, and uh, we will go to the coffee break. <laughs> I'll try to be quick. First of all, thanks for your presentation. My question is, uh, you wonder how can we measure these let's say, micro actions of citizen participation. My question is, should we? I mean, as the observer always influence the observed. Yeah, yeah. And when we take a measurement, we're always changing what we measure. Isn't yeah. it that maybe these things work exactly because they are anonymous? Isn't it that maybe anonymity is part of what they make them so effective? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a very good thought, uh, and I've had the same thought about it as well. Uh, we, 
when we measure, we, we, we can constrain, we can impose, we can shape, as you say. Um, but uh, that said, I think um, by measuring, and measuring maybe is a very strong word, I think maybe identifying and recognizing and acknowledging a bit more informally is perhaps better. Uh, by doing so, we can help to highlight the good work that is happening around us. And by highlighting that good work, we can encourage others to follow a similar path. And right now, I think the examples we see, many of the examples we see and we talk about in the media and in our classes are um, a poor state of civic affairs uh, across the world. Uh, and I don't believe it. Uh, I think we, if we can do a better job identifying, maybe measuring a little bit, uh, we can paint a better picture and provide a better model for, uh, for citizens to follow. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Let's thank Thomas for this uh, brilliant uh, presentation. And I think everybody has enjoyed the discussion. And before leaving to the uh, coffee break, I would uh, ask Dario to say several words about our social program. One of the most important things in the conferences, right? <laughs> Hello, everybody. <coughs> Welcome to ICON. Uh, thank you, Tom, for your uh, lecture. Uh, just very practical uh, information about tonight. As uh, you know, there is a concert. Uh, you are all very, very welcome to, uh, to join. So most of you know already where the building is. It's called Trade Room A, or building number three, something like that. Um, <clears throat> it's in Freedom Avenue. So when you go out from the main uh, um, entrance of this building, you will just turn right until you meet this pedestrian, big pedestrian road. You turn on the left and you go towards the, that white church. When you pass the white church, the number 13 will be the, the building. So we start at uh, 7.30. You can already see the program outside. It's going to be a um, violin and piano uh, chamber music concert. And uh, uh, you can also see the, uh, the repertoire. So thank you very much and enjoy your coffee break.